This lowly cabbie is about to reveal the greatest secret of Christianity, hiding in plain sight, right in Matthew 16:18. That two-faced Roman mythical god, the Janus, has something to do with why the church hasn't seen it until now. You will learn all the particulars in this video. Now, the greatest secret of Christianity is how to walk through that door into the kingdom of God and be seated in God's presence and have eternal life. You need the keys of the kingdom to do that, to get that door open. I know who has them, where they are, and how you can get them, and then I can show you where that door is so that you know precisely how to use them to get in. How could a lowly cabbie know that when the great scholarship of both Catholics and Protestants who have been arguing about this context forever and they don't know? How is that possible? Well, I'm going to prove to you my bona fides. So if you're a Christian or a Catholic or a Protestant, bear with me. I will prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that all those experts, Protestants, and all the expert Catholics are wrong. I'm going to prove it to you beyond a reasonable doubt to establish my credentials, that I know what the keys of the kingdom are, and I can show them to you. And if you stick with me a little while, you will know in just a few minutes just how wrong they are. Now, logically speaking, when you have two objects and they have the same properties, they are the same thing. Now, if there's an incompatible property between them, then they are different. That top context, Matthew 7, chapter, uh, verses 24 and 25, has four distinct ideas in it that also exist in that context that Catholic and Protestant scholars argue about all the time, Matthew 16, 16 through 18. And I've color coded them. So these elements, these properties are common to both contexts. They're blue, green, yellow, and red. They're common to both. So they are the same thing. It's like the same apple. You've heard that saying, you can't compare apples and oranges. Well, we're not. We are comparing an apple with an apple. And if you eat the apple one way and it's the same apple, you eat it again the same way. You don't change because if you only change if it wasn't an apple, then you would do something different. These two contexts define, that top one defines how the bottom one is to be interpreted. There's only one way to interpret the top one, and that's the way Christ set it up. So when we go to the bottom one, we have to do what Christ did in the top one in the bottom one. And Catholic and Protestant experts never do this. You can go through all their literature, and not once will you see them refer to Matthew chapter 7, 24, 25. They'll argue with each other all day long, and not once will they mention this context. Now, we're going to go through this in the next few slides. It's going to be easy. You're going to see just how wrong they are beyond all reasonable doubt. You could actually document it in a court of law that those guys totally missed the boat. And then my bona fides will be established. You will know that although I am, yes, a lowly cab driver, I do know what I'm talking about. The divine content of Christ's teachings, these sayings of mine, that is a revelation from God himself. Jesus is the second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Eternal Son. Anything he teaches is divine revelation. And it will never change, because God never changes. The theme here is about a wise man who builds his house on a rock. So when Christ is talking about heeding his sayings, and he likens that to building your house on a rock, clearly the petra rock 
is a metaphor for his sayings. Now, why a petrol rock? Well, if you watched a rock from your childhood to your old age, it will never change. So a rock is a perfect metaphor for unchanging divine revelation. And that is what Christ is doing here. He's using rock to represent his sayings. Now we come to the primary reason why scholarship simply does not connect Matthew 7, 24, 25 with Matthew 16, 16 through 18. When they're looking at Matthew 7, 25, they see prophecy. Now in the exegetical summary of Matthew 1 through 16, what the major commentaries have to say about Matthew 7, 25 are helpfully listed in one paragraph. Check it out. Final judgment, ultimate ordeal, which is death itself, storms of life, upheaval of the last days prior to the end of the world. Of course, if you think that text is prophetic, now remember, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the very tail end of it. If you think it's prophecy, then you're not even going to think about Matthew 16, 16 through 18. It totally goes over your head. Now, why scholars didn't see this as two-way genre, I have no idea. It's classic. You have the wise man building his house on a rock, and when the floods come, it doesn't collapse. And the unwise man doesn't build upon the sayings of Christ. And, of course, the collapse of that house is very great. This is classic, two-way genre. You choose one, it's better than the other. As in Deuteronomy 30:19, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, two-way genre. Or just a few verses above our target text, the narrow gate and the broad gate. Of course, Christ says enter by the narrow gate because that's the one that leads to life. So why can scholars think of that as prophecy in Matthew 7:25? is simply unfathomable. I, I can't figure it out. Maybe you can. I can't. You know, it's interesting to notice that Paul clearly reworked the material in 7, 24, and 25 in his sermon here in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Spiritual wickedness in high places clearly is a parallel to the rains, floods, and winds that fall down from heaven against the poor wise man's house and uh, beats against it. He's an obedient child of God. These sayings of mine, that's clearly a parallel to being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. If you're standing in that, then like the man who is built upon that, you can stand against whatever the devil throws against you. The parallels are clear. Paul is not interpreting that as prophecy. He's looking at it as didactic teaching. Now, I have searched my tiny brain for any reason at all, remote reason, how scholars can connect rain, floods, and winds with Judgment Day and end time events. I just can't see it. Maybe you can, I cannot. If anything, that parallel, gates of hell, should jump up and slap them in the face. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. How is that prophetic? Look at this text here in Revelation 12, 15. If anything, they should have connected it to this. Here the serpent casts out water as a flood after the woman who represents the church. So you go to Matthew 16, 18, you got the gates of hell, and he's fighting against the church. And there's the connection, Revelation 12, 15. Or in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 22, 5. David speaks about the waves of death, the floods of Belial. Now we know Belial is another name for Satan in 2 Corinthians 6, 15. I cannot fathom why scholarship didn't go here. If they're going to go anywhere from this text, why not here? You tell me, I don't know, let's move on. Yeah, returning to the parallel context, 
the wise man builds his house upon the immutable truth of Christ's sayings. He's building on the Petra. So when the forces of nature come against that house, it falls not. Now let's check out the bottom context and see if we have the same general ideas in there. Now let's focus on the bottom context. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. That revelation Peter received from the Father in heaven. God is immutable, never changes. He never speaks anything but the truth, so his truth never changes. And this is about the identity of Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, so he never changes. Therefore, this is immutable to the nth degree. Now notice, just as in the above context, we're still talking about building upon a rock. Now here it's a church, in the above context it was a house. But you're building on the same green, immutable Petra rock. Now just like in the top context, the gates of hell could not prevail against the house that was built on the unchanging Petra rock. So clearly, these contexts are in parallel. Apples to apples. You can't interpret the top one differently than you do the bottom. The Petra must be the same thing in both contexts. The divine, unchanging revelation of God. In the top, it's the teachings of Christ. In the bottom, it's the revelation that God gave to Peter about the identity of Jesus Christ. That is the Petra. The church is built on the Petra that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And those are the keys to the kingdom, in case you're wondering. We'll get back to that later. Clearly, this is a sound apples-to-apples apples comparison the four main ideas common to both, there are no incompatible properties relevant to the Petra being either the sayings of Christ or the revelation of the Father that he gave to Simon. I think I've established my bona fides. I have seen something that the experts did not see. If you're doubting whether a lowly cabbie can see something that the scholars have missed, I think I've proved my case beyond all reasonable doubt. Yes, it can happen. And I wanted to show you more. So if you will, at least for the length of this video, suspend belief, disbelief, and give me a chance to argue my case, I will prove that the keys of the kingdom are right there in this context. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, and that Matthew 16, 18 is an asymmetric Janus parallelism. Now, you might be wondering, how can thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, be the keys, when Jesus said he wouldn't give the keys to Peter until sometime in the future? Well, if you notice, he also says he will build his church in the future. And why is it put into the future? Well, there's a chronology here. First, Christ has to rise from the dead. You see there in Colossians 3, 1, ye actually is speaking to the church, are risen with Christ. In Ephesians 2, 5, 6, Paul speaks of us being quickened with Christ and raised up with him and made to sit in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. So therefore the door, the keys into heaven didn't come into existence until the resurrection of Jesus Christ when the church came into existence. And then that channel of God's grace that goes right into heaven itself, that path through that door, all comes into existence. So Peter couldn't receive the keys at this point in time, even though the confession, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, are the keys. Because technically they didn't exist. And it wasn't until after the resurrection of Christ that Peter and the church, the keys, the binding and loosing authority, that channel of God's grace, the door into heaven, that place in heavenly places, wait, a reserve for us. None of that existed 
until Jesus rose from the dead. So it had to be put into the future. But that does not contradict that thou art the Christ, son of the living God, are the keys to the kingdom. Downing Thomases would ask, what other indications in this context can you give me that Simon was born again when he confessed the Petra of God, thou art the Christ, son of the living God? Well, I believe it's right there in the very next verse. Christ breaks out into a macarism. He says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Now, why would he declare Simon blessed? In the past, when people said, you're the son of God, they did so because of awe or astonishment, something Christ said or did. Here, it was because Peter confessed divine revelation publicly. So Christ is declaring him blessed. Now, was it blessed just because he received divine revelation? Or is there something more? I believe it's something more, and it's indicated by Matthew not translating Bar Jonah into Greek. He left it Aramaic. Bar means after the order of, after it, part of a class, son of. And Christ often call, mentioned the sign of the prophet Jonah as being relevant to his ministry. There we see in uh, chapter 12, verse 40, just as Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days and three nights, so he would be in the heart of the earth three days, three nights. So Christ saw parallels. He would look at people in situations and say, hey, you're, this is like that. He's doing that to Simon. He's declaring that Simon is after the order of the prophet Jonah. In what way? Well, Jonah was in the belly of the big fish, and he writes that he was in hell. It was like he was dead. And he cries out to God and the fish vomits him out on dry land. That's like a resurrection. And then the prophet goes to the city of Nineveh, preaching the divine revelation of God that if any of them heard it, they would live. I believe Christ is looking at Peter and he's seeing this in Peter. He's seeing that figuratively speaking, Simon had just risen from the dead. He is now confessing divine revelation. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, which if any man will heed, if they will believe that in their heart and confess it with their mouth, they will be saved. So he sees the prophet Jonah when he's looking at Simon. That indicates Christ was acknowledging that Simon was born again at this point in time. Confirming those are the keys to the kingdom, thou art the Christ, son of the living God, is the context in Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 11. Paul is clearly dependent upon the event in Matthew 16, 16. He's reworking that material for his own sermon about how to be saved. And he's talking about confessing Jesus publicly, just like Simon did. But let's walk through it. When Paul looks at Christ, he sees salvation. And so he uses it figuratively. Bringing Christ down from above is figurative of bringing the truth of how to be saved down from heaven where it's hidden from view. Now, what happened to Peter? God the Father in heaven brought down the truth of Christ's identity to Peter on earth. And then Peter confessed it. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. That is the word of faith. Now, confirming Paul is thinking about Peter, just like with Peter, the word is near in your mouth and in your heart. It just suddenly appears there. Confirming Paul is thinking about Peter when he wrote this sermon, he calls it the word of faith. Rima in, in 2 Corinthians 12.4 was used of unspeakable words not lawful to utter by someone who, who heard them in heaven. So that is divine revelation. Thou art the Christ is divine revelation. Confirming this, Paul says it's the word we preach, the Lord Jesus. Well, that's what that revelation that Peter confessed is, the Lord Jesus, that he is the Christ son of the living God. Now, the reason why Peter couldn't get the keys at that time 
is because even though he confessed them and they made him born again right there because Christ had yet to rise from the dead and then the church would come into existence and all things would come alive including the keys the binding and loosing authority so that was all future so Christ said I will give thee the keys but there they are Paul is seeing these things after the resurrection of Christ so the keys are there right there in Matthew 16 16 you know the precise wording of the keys that open up the door into the kingdom of God and you know how to use them you confess them publicly believing in your heart that they're true that God is watching and then is saved so now you can go out and share them with other people if you want to stick it stick it with this video you'll learn all about the asymmetric Janus parallelism I know it sounds complicated but how complicated could it be I'm a taxi driver you know and I got it I will break it down for you make the complex simple it'll be easy peasy but if not peace be to you God bless for hundreds perhaps thousands of years hiding in plain sight were asymmetric Janus parallelisms in 1978 Cyrus Gordon discovered these and he coined that term using the Roman mythical god the Janus one face looks back into the past the other face looks forward into the future they're different so it's asymmetric it's a parallelism because the act of looking is the same even though it is opposite directions once scholarship was made aware these Janus parallelisms exist now they're discovering them all over the Old Testament while they were looking in the Old Testament I decided to look in the new now technically Matthew 16 19 is not a Janus parallelism there is no hominem looking both ways but this parallelism was created by an actual Janus in Matthew 16 18 it was in Matthew 16 18 that this forward backward perspective was created so we can look at this as though it is a ripple of an actual Janus like a stone tossed into a lake creates ripples this is a ripple of an actual Janus whatever is bound or loosed on earth in the past is then bound or loosed in heaven so the Janus would be Peter looking back and God looking forward now Cyrus Gordon identified this as a Janus now, I didn't buy his book so I don't know exactly what he has to say on this but this is the way I take it Zemir is the hominem the King James Version looking at that word they're thinking springtime there's a turtle dove there so they singing of birds the ancient Greek Septuagint they see the word flowers they're looking in the past Zamir means pruning it actually means both King Solomon was communicating an entire picture and both of those translations lost what the author intended Solomon was thinking it's springtime Romeo is pruning flowers and he's singing he's got a song he's gonna to sing to his turtle dove the love of his life and then she will respond her voice will be cooing and the reason why there's a lot of cooing heard in the land it's springtime there's a whole bunch of Romeos out there romancing a lot of turtle doves so the voice of the turtle is heard in the land now that's a lot of content that's like a picture both of those translations missed it if you just focused on what they said you didn't come up with that picture you needed inferential logic what John the Apostle called the mind that has wisdom but you can't employ that until you know that this is an asymmetric Janus parallelism now notice it caused these translations problems both of them they see these other meanings this other content in the verse implied by the Hebrew but they have to choose one meaning over another so they end up losing content 
Solomon meant both meanings. And it's only when you combine both meanings and you're seeing the Janus, you're seeing in both directions, that you get the full intent of that word. Matthew 16, 18 is precisely that. Christ used Petros as the Janus. It is actually a homonym, meaning both firstborn and stone. Now, I'm going to prove that in the next coming slides, and then I'll show you how all this comes together, and it's a wonderful thing. Now, for one to see the Janus in Matthew 16, 18, they must first know that in that unique Aramaic that Christ and his apostles spoke in Palestine, there was a proper name, meaning firstborn, that when transliterated into Greek was spelled precisely like Petros stone. It likely came from the Hebrew word Peter, Strong's Concordance, 63, 63, and it meant firstborn, or that which was first out of the womb. Here is the Janus in Matthew 16, 18. Looking back, Peter had just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had become firstborn of the divine revelation of Christ. That never happened before. He is the first. Christ says to him, you really are Petros, emphasizing the meaning of firstborn in his Aramaic name. Then looking forward, he mentions he will give Peter the keys of the kingdom in the future. That implies that a special relationship. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros lively stone of the church. So the timeline is what obscures this Janus. Christ must rise from the dead and begin building his church before the spiritual house, the holy priesthood, and Peter's relationship as a Petros, a Kepha, lively stone, had come into existence. So that is why in the middle of this Janus, we have, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That must happen before he can give Peter the keys of the kingdom. And when Peter gets the keys, it implies that he has already become a Kepha Petros, lively stone in that channel of God's grace. There are no keys apart from the channel of God's grace. Now that we've seen the Janus in Matthew 16, 18, and we'll return to it as need be, let's review the premises. There was an Aramaic spoken by Christ and his apostles in Palestine, a unique name, meaning firstborn, Petros, that when transliterated into Greek is spelled precisely like Petros stone, and it was a hasty generalization to confuse the two but the church can be forgiven because when the Jewish a nation was cast out of Israel by the Romans, that unique Aramaic Hebrew speaking culture of Christ and his apostles vanished in the church. So when they came upon the Greek word Petros, they naturally assumed it meant Petros stone. And the later Aramaic translations all follow that hasty generalization. So that indicates Greek primacy, because the Aramaic Petros is preserved like all other, like the other Aramaic that Christ and his apostles spoke, is preserved in our Greek texts. A lot of Aramaic in there that's not translated, it's just transliterated into Greek. And Petros is one of those. Now here in this lectionary, according to the professor, who we will see next slide, there is an Aramaic a word Petros. Now I can't be sure I'm looking and seeing the same thing because I can't read Aramaic. But I did my best trying to identify the the word. 
if you look in that center column right below Matthew 16 18 one line down counting from right to left third word over Petros and if you go up two verses of Matthew 16 16 one line down counting from right to left second word over Petros there it is but really I can't read Aramaic so we have to trust the next guy the professor who I, who says it's here in the professor's book Peter and the Rock he translates the Aramaic into Hebrew if you look there on page 34 towards the bottom and I say to thee thou art Petros and on this Kepha I shall build my church and he observes that here Petros and Kepha are distinct now if you wanted to see it in the Hebrew right above that it's the sixth word over counting from left to right the New Testament confirms Simon was called Petros before he met Jesus in 418 of Matthew Christ seen him by the sea and in 419 he says follow me in John 140 Andrew is already known as Simon Peter's brother and then they both go and they find Jesus the clincher is in Matthew 16 18 when Jesus said thou art Petros that's present tense he didn't become Petros at that time just as in Matthew 16 16 when Simon said thou art the Christ he didn't become the Christ at that time now careful readers of John 142 notice this is in the future Simon would be called Cephas it doesn't say it happened here thou shalt be called Cephas now John when he interprets Cephas to be a Petros that's unusual Petros and Petra were both archaic Greek he should have used lethos just like Peter did in first Peter chapter 2 he substitute substitutes lethos for for both Petros and Petra and Kepha right there in that context so John is using Petros for a reason it's like an arrow pointing to Matthew 16 18 he wants us to look at that text it's the only place in the Bible where Jesus called Simon Petros and now we know the equivalency here that John set up Cephas by interpretation is a Petros that means Petros by interpretation is a Cephas now some modern translations actually make this stronger they'll say Cephas when translated is a Petros well that means Petros when translated is a Cephas so if we want to understand Matthew 16 18 we're not going to look at Petros the meaning of the Greek stone we're going to look at Cephas the meaning of that in Aramaic now, returning to the Janus looking back into the past there is another confirmation that Peter was born again at that time that he became the firstborn of the gospel of Christ if we look at the binding and loosing authority that he got look all the way towards the bottom the right of the firstborn is a double portion Peter got double the binding and loosing authority compared to the rest of the Apostles when they bound and loose they had to get agreement there had to be at least two in agreement whereas Peter whatever he bound or loosed he could act on his own so that indicates that he was born again firstborn of the gospel of Christ right there now you could also mention the idea that he would get the keys being it's in this context might imply that well the firstborn gets the keys of the estate he is opened shut doors however the entire church does get these keys also so I don't know how much to read into that but the binding and loosing authority definitely indicates the right of the firstborn double portion and he has double the binding and loosing of power authority over the other Apostles additional confirmation that Petros is a homonym are the two radically different perspectives of Matthew compared to Mark and John 
Matthew sees Petros as earliest, the one called firstborn in Matthew 10, 2. Now that's not part of a numbering system because the second guy mentioned is not number two and the third is not number three. So it's not a numbering system. Neither is it any reference to privacy because right after the event in Matthew 16, 18, the apostles are still arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Now had Jesus given Peter primacy in Mark 16, I mean Matthew 16, 18, then that argument would never happen. So the parsimonious interpretation of Protos in Matthew 10, 2 is precisely as I have it, and it's consistent with Matthew 4, 18, where he's already called firstborn before he met Christ, earliest Simon, the one called firstborn. However, John and Mark, they're not seeing it that way. They're seeing Petros stone, the Greek meaning, kepha. Mark says that Simon was surnamed Petros, just as James and John are surnamed Sons of Thunder. Now, that technically is not a proper name. That's more like a description. And John says Cephas, by interpretation, is a Petros. Now, the word interpretation is more parsimoniously understood precisely as the King James Version has it, not as translation. At the time, when Christ, when this happened, Cephas was not a proper name either. So neither one of those are proper names. They're both meaning stone. When John said Cephas, by interpretation, is a Petros, some modern translations render that Cephas, when translated, is Petros. Well, that makes what I'm about to say even stronger, because that means the reverse is also true. Petros, when translated, is Cephas. And if we need to know what that Cephas means to Christ and his apostles. We don't look at the Greek meaning of stone. We look at the Aramaic meaning of Cephas. And here we find in the Targums and the Talmud, in Aramaic, rock when bored, giving forth water, pearls, jewels, precious stones, jewelry. Deuteronomy 32, 13 is very interesting. I included the Greek Septuagint here because the word Petra appears along with Kepha in the Aramaic, Targum. Suck honey out of the rock, oil out of the flinty rock. Oil represents, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. So you're getting life, divine life, out of a flinty rock. Now, clearly that must be connected with that imagery of living water coming from the rock. Now in Proverbs 17.8, the precious stone, it's being used like a stone of grace, a gracious wage that turns back wrath and opens up possibilities that otherwise would be shut. Now Peter has transferred the meanings of Kepha, Petros, and Petra onto Lethos, when writing 1 Peter 2 through 6. Notice he calls Christ a living stone and he calls the church lively stones. That's getting oil out of the rock, life out of the rock. Honey, that made Jonathan's eyes beam in 1 Samuel 14, 27, that energy. So you're getting energy from the rock, spirit, life. Oil from the flinty rock, spirit, life. Christ is that spiritual rock that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness. When Moses struck it, out of it came water, life-giving water, a spiritual drink. All who drank that lived. Notice in the Septuagint, same Greek word, Petra. And he transferred that kepha meaning of precious to Christ. Christ is the one who turns away the wrath of God by the blood of the Lamb. In him we prosper spiritually. Notice he says on the bottom, Christ is that cornerstone, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded, because the wrath of God has been turned away, and now you're prospering in him. 
So the transference to lethos, when applied to either Christ or the apostles, indicates that Peter is thinking about Matthew 16:18, that relationship that Christ established in that genus between Petra and Petros. Here it's living stone, lethos, and lively stones, lethos. But it's the same relationship, the same meanings have been applied to lethos. It's clear Peter is applying to the church what Christ applied to him. Let's look into that a little closer. Now it's often missed, but let's look at that functional relationship that we see in in 1 Peter verses 2 and 3. Notice in verse 3, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, then in verse 2, you are a newborn babe desiring the sincere milk of God's word. Verse 3, if you have not tasted that the Lord is gracious, then, verse 2, you would not be a newborn babe desiring the sincere milk of God's word. So what did they taste before they were newborn babes, born again? They tasted the living water. They got oil from the flinty rock, that living water from Christ, that mass of Petra rock. Now that relationship, that analogy, greater to lesser analogy is evident in Matthew 16, 18 by the apposition of Petros and Petra. It implies this relationship that we see in 1 Peter 2, 2 through 6, the living stone, lively stone relationship. Clearly, Peter has in mind that event in Matthew 16, 18, and he's applying the Janus just the way Christ applied it to him he has now applied it to the church. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 6 is additional confirmation that Matthew 16, 18 is a genus, that Peter was being surnamed Petros in Greek, even while Christ was emphasizing the Aramaic firstborn meaning of the name he already had. And when he said, I will give thee unto thee the keys of the kingdom, that confirms that that Petra, Petros, Kepha relationship, that living stone, lively stone relationship would exist. And then, of course, he would have the keys. He'd be part of that channel of God's grace. You don't have the keys unless you're part of that channel. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros lively stone of the church. So to sum this up, all the evidence shows Petros Peter is a homonym. Looking back into the past, it's the Aramaic word, firstborn, looking forward into the future. It's the Kepha Petros stone, as meant in the Aramaic Targums and Talmud, that Aramaic that was spoken in the days of Christ. Very unique. Matthew was looking back when he was first born, early as Simon, the one called firstborn. Mark and John are looking into the future after that Kepha, Petros, uh, water-bearing relationship is established. And Peter then is able to get the keys and reveal Christ to the world. Here it is. It's all right there. I think I've made a good case for this, and it's uh, a strong one. Peace be to you. I just have a couple of more comments, and that's it. But this is a wrap. Now, remember, before all those experts start flooding in how I can't be right, remember how blind they were to Matthew 7, 24, 25, how they ignore it entirely when they're interpreting Matthew 16, 16 through 18. They didn't see this. I did. I have some credibility that they do not have. In the writings of the fathers, 44 thought the rock was Peter's confession. 16, the rock was Christ. They're actually in fundamental agreement. They're both looking at the confession 
the identity of Jesus that Peter confessed, that divine content, and they're thinking, okay, 16 said, the rock is Christ. The 44 said, well, actually, he's confessing that identity. So that is imprecise. He, they didn't focus on the actual Petra, and because of that imprecision, they didn't realize the keys of the kingdom is that exact, precise, divine content that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that that is the key to being born again. You confess that, you believe it in your heart, you're drinking that water, and you confess it publicly, and then people are saved. I just want you to notice the confirmation it's a Janus. Some of these fathers, even in their own writings, they would see a waver between two different opinions. And the reason for that is, when you look at a Janus from one direction, it has one meaning, and you look at another, maybe on a different day, and it seems to have a different meaning. So you begin to uh, waver between interpretations. And that's what happened in the early church fathers. And it's still happening in a church. Perhaps now that we know this is a Janus parallelism, people will find them everywhere in the New Testament, just like they find them everywhere in the Old Testament. Now, I found one in Matthew 16, 19. Actually, Revelation 13, 18, that 666 riddle, is a Janus. But that video on that that's uh, on my site, that's irrelevant here. Just wanted to point out these things cause problems and hopefully now that we know it's a Janus parallelism that will clear up and we will have that precision that's required to know that the keys of the kingdom is that exact divine content that Jesus is the Christ son of the living God and once you have that precision it's easy to share with others one last text, John 20, 31. He writes that we might know the Petra and then have life through that knowledge. Clearly, that's the key of the kingdom right there. It's the Petra upon which the church is built. It's all implicit right there in that verse. Now, this genus parallelism is very important to the church. It proves a lot of what scholarship have done to the integrity of our Bibles is wrong. Error hasn't crept in. Jesus Christ said, and he is the eternal son of God, not one jot or tittle will pass until all is fulfilled. Now he wasn't talking about diacritical marks, shapes of letters, or accents. He was talking about meaning because you cannot fulfill that stuff. That is, doesn't have meaning. You could describe a picture using many different words. A picture could be described, even though the word order is changed, even if the spelling of certain words is a little bit different, the same picture is being described perfectly. So when Christ said, not one jot or tittle of meaning will be lost, that actually happened. And those people who claim that our New Testaments uh, have to be redone at using manuscripts that were tossed away by the church because they were so defective, nobody wanted to use them. It's ridiculous. These scholars have cast doubt and diminished the word of God and they subtracted from it. I am convinced on the day of judgment, there's going to be a lot of screams among them. The Janus parallelism actually proves the text in Matthew 16, 18 is authentic scripture, unlike what they have been saying. There's a lot of other evidences. We mentioned some of them here where clearly the text is being pointed to by other passages. So beyond doubt, it is scripture. And there are other uh, indications. If you went to my site, I have a long blog post on this. And I, I, I uh, produced additional evidence. The phenomena of the names of Simon and Petros in the book of Mark, they clearly indicate that it was at Matthew 16, 18, that Simon was called Petros, stone, by Christ. Because from that point on, Petros really is a burst of usage. However, you go to my site, you get all the details about that. 
There's also a little donate button there. I am not a tax deductible um, ministry. If you do donate anything, you cannot write it off your taxes. It's not tax deductible. But I promise I will use it exclusively to make better videos, especially on this video, not any other videos. This is the one I would focus on, and I would focus on paying Google AdWords to get the word out so that people can watch this video. But if you don't want to donate, hey, that's fine. I have my own business. I do make money with my own hands, so I don't need your money. It was just to help so that I could do more to get the word out. But you can still welcome to go to my site and check out all the little articles I have there. I think you might like it. Some of it has a unique perspective. Just like here, I have a unique perspective on a lot of Bible prophecy you will not get anywhere else. Although, unfortunately, I'm not a good writer. I'm a bad writer. I'm obtuse. I'm a hard read. I hope you could plow through my poorly written posts and get what's good out of them www.endtimenews.net. Go there. Enjoy. Peace be to you. Keep your eyes focused on the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Maranatha. Amen.